I'd like to start by saying that I'm not an educator by degree. I've never ever taught in a school classroom. What I do have is a bachelor's degree in hotel management and a master's degree in public administration. I also have 15 years of experience in dealing with the outcomes of education and also the inputs within it. I believe that I have added value to the organizations and the communities that I operated within from those collection and plethora of experiences that I went through in those 15 years. I took life as an opportunity to take every experience as a learning opportunity. And that's what makes me who and what I am today. I went to private schools in the UAE, and as such, I was able to mix and mingle with a melange of nationalities and cultures and backgrounds that enabled me to understand colloquial understandings of different cultures, which helped widen my horizons and also create a new definition of tolerance within me. I have value, uh, however, sorry, this is something I need to mention because it's such a funny thing to say. If you took me back to school at university or even at high school, and asked me a question in anything related to geography, physics, or maths, you'll find that until this day, I still count with my fingers. <laughs> no joke. Some of my colleagues here can agree to that. Um, and on that point, it is about experiences. I think what I add as value is exactly what researchers, scientists, engineers, and experts provide. Their value is from experiences. So therefore, I believe that we need to ask the question of, what needs to change in our system based on that, our education system, and why? Something that um, a typical student goes through is the education system. They go through the K-12, to they get into examinations, and they believe in the system's ability to prepare them for that future. Parents put the kids in exactly the same system because that's what they went through, and they think that they've cracked the formula. The formula is get an education, get a job, and you're set for life. However, I think we can all agree in this room that that is no longer the case. In fact, if you look at all the different experiences that children go through, it is the crucible experiences that make them and define them as individuals within society. And something else that's important to mention is the system provides for knowledge, but it doesn't actually provide, it, uh, provide experiences. For today, if we were to say that knowledge is a unique selling product, is a lie. It is a free, readily available asset that is at every person's fingertips. So again, what needs to change and why? One of the things that I believe in is that we need to create continuous learners. We need to create individuals within our communities and societies that adapt to whatever technologies are presented and represented and reinvented over time. So learning is no longer finite. Education is something that has no end. It is a continuous perseverance of the individual to improve and continue to improve themselves, their being, their skill set. Everything starts at home. Learning happens from the tender age of big fat zero, as soon as you're born. Early childhood education research proves that the return on investment for early childhood education is immense over time. Yet if we look at our public education system, we start with children at the age of six. Why is that? How can we ensure that we promote children to become more effective as individuals as they grow? I don't believe that education can continue being in a classroom or a school. We've put children in a sandbox for as long as they can handle it, putting them in a box throughout their lives right up to the time they hit university, I think is unfair. I believe that life has become the classroom and all we need to do is find a way to document every learning experience that that individual goes through. There was a study that was conducted in uh, 2017 by The Independent that looked at how many of the s individuals who are young people use smartphones. They found out in the UK that 25% of children under the age of six own a smartphone. Of those 25%, 25% of them spend up to 21 hours per week. Yet when we take these beautiful little creatures and throw them into a classroom, they are denied the one thing that they use so often, which is a phone. 
simply because the system has not found a way to utilize this technology to its maximum benefit. So, teachers are no longer knowledge or information providers. They are experienced curators. That means every learner has the ability to use a support system in the form of mentors who are teachers to guide them through the various experiences that they need to go through in their lifetime. Learning becomes customized and truly unique to the individual learner's passion and curiosity. An example of this is an, uh, an initiative that was launched by a gentleman called Sugata Mitra in India, who believed that if you gave a child access to a computer and the internet, they can learn anything that they can want, even quantum physics to that extent. And as a result, children were able to actually play, going back to my previous presenter's talk, and really self-learn, pacing themselves according to what they see is curious and something that they would enjoy. This later developed into what's called the school in the cloud, which helped groups of individuals create souls, or what they call self-organized learning environments, whereby knowledge and experience and skills and connecting to the collective network of people becomes, a, uh, becomes a, um, a habit almost. So imagine that this initiative was able to grant access to those individuals that were in need of quality education. On the topic of quality, everybody has become so obsessed with quantifying, standardized tests, inspection frameworks, rankings of OECD, PISA, TIMS, PEARLS, you name it, right? Yet, I recently had the privilege of being in a conference in, in London called Learn It. You might have heard of it. And I was sitting in a, in a <laughs> panel made up of two of the most prestigious schools in London that were for boys and girls separately. And the topic of that conversation was relevance versus rankings. Now, to give you the summary, we agreed that although rankings are important, they are not necessarily always relevant. If you were to ask me, what could be an alternative to school rankings? Here's my proposition. A school that changes over time and innovates and tries to introduce new ways of learning, teaching, innovating, is more valid to me as an individual than comparing that school to another school. Meaning, a school that might have less budget, working in a very difficult area within the community, has been more effective over time than somebody who's been number one for the longest time because they have all the budget and all the facilities to be the best. So basically, we definitely need an alternative to ranking. I believe that education is a continuous cycle. You are continuously adding to your knowledge, your skills, your network from the younger age of zero. You're going into play dates. You're going into nursery, kindergarten. Those connections can last a lifetime. And that adding of knowledge should be something that happens all the time. Meaning, if a child is so adamant about a specific area of knowledge or a sector, they should be able to add to the body of knowledge, not just PhD students and research institutes. So basically, you add to that body of knowledge. An example of this from history is Mozart. He was a composer of music at the tender age of five. He added to his sector from that age. You look at Arfa from Pakistan, who was a certified computer genius by Microsoft at the tender age of nine. So how many of these Arfas and Mozarts exist in our system? Do, do we know them? And maybe even worse, do we give them an opportunity to really experience their curiosity, their passion, and really fulfill their purposes? So my question is this, how can we find them, more of them, and make sure that they are utilized to their maximum potential? So going back to the duck example, you can continue to reiterate on that duck design and you can reach your own potential from it rather than just fitting into a system in a peg. This man needs no introductions. He is a man who single-handedly sold his first code at the age of 12 for $500. He sold his first company to Compaq for $314 million, in addition to stock options. And the way this guy recruits his top people is by asking one simple question. What is the biggest problem or challenge that you have solved, and how? 
Think about the math equation if everybody's done a math test. I don't care what equation you get to or what results you get to, show me how you got to it. That's what makes you an individual that's worth anything in life. So I ask you in the audience, if you asked yourself this question today, would you be very proud of the answer you give yourself? And even more so, the students and the teachers and the individuals that you interact with, if you ask them this question, how proud would you be of that success factor? Because it is, it, it is one indicator, right? Here's a quote that, li that I personally like for this guy. When something is important, you do it, even if the odds are not in your favor. I honestly believe that we have enough in this system to make a difference, and it's about just doing rather than talking this whole time. Education has been the lifelong uh, pursuit of knowledge, acquiring of skills, and connecting to the collective. I believe that education has changed so much, but it existed before the first industrial revolution. If you think about the high people of society back in the days, they had a really fluid, sense of learning. They went as protégés and attachés of individuals and traveled the world and really got a good education. When by the time the second industrial revolution came in, they were all standardized, put into a system, and it was so structured. So think about the structures that you have right now. What are the freedoms that you can offer that are structured, rather than structuring the freedoms, if that makes any sense? You want to be able to allow for fluidity, allow for play. And that starts by having a healthy dialogue. So all great change comes from two things. Having a healthy conversation with others and really broadening your horizons. But then right after that is taking action. That means testing is the, is the word of the era. It is the creme de la creme for what we're about to walk into. We need to be able to prototype and test. And I think the UAE has been a great example for that. We actually established, as you're all here and seeing, the Dubai Future Foundation. The whole purpose of this foundation is to test and try things of the future, asking the right questions, seeing what things we could do that could change our future. And we had one question that we asked, and, and maybe this is an example to give. The registration of newborn babies in the UAE was such a long and tedious process. You had several agencies that you had to attend to, forms, etc. After a successful 100-day prototype with the Dubai Future Foundation, that long journey has been summarized now in three clicks. You can register a newborn child in the UAE with just three clicks. So obviously, and this is a, an honest to God truth, we have no excuse to not try and test an alternative because the future generations deserve that. And what they deserve is probably three things in the education system. It has to be holistic, so looking at them from mind, body, and soul, not just mind. It has to be about inclusiveness, allowing for multiple people to come in together and learn from each other. And it has to be effective. Effective meaning future ready, future proof. So let me share a vision that I have of what I think the future of education could look like. As I said before, the teaching profession becomes Uberized. You are no longer a teacher by profession. Everybody becomes a teacher because you learn from everyone, anytime and anywhere. Right? That's, that's what I really believe in. The second part is everything is monitored and recorded by an AI-enabled system, meaning as a teacher, as a learner, as a parent, I access the system and I can immediately see what this learner has gone through, what activities have they worked on, what projects have they approved, what ambitions have they achieved, really looking into the actual achievements of individuals. In addition to that, I would implore teachers to consider themselves as mentors, as individuals who curate this experience for the child, rather than indoctrinating them into a curriculum that is rigid and so non-customized, right? So basically everyone can be a teacher. Everyone can be part of an experience for a learner, for them to improve themselves and gain something new or understand something new that they've never been through before. So let's ask this question. If you had gone back in history, because all of us have been touched by education in this room, 
We've all gone through a system of sort. We've all gone through a curriculum of sort. If you could go back, you said three things. I say one thing. If you could change just one thing that you have gone through as part of your education system that has led you to where you are today and could have been better, what would that one thing be? How would you change it? And then change it. We are all parts of the system. The system has to change from one, which is why I say maybe one thing could lead to another. Yes, we have ed technologies that are trying to go against the machine, but the machine is still there. It needs to be defragmented, providing that alternative that I talked about with the prototype. So although I don't like to end on a, on a low note, but I have this statement to give. I don't know which of you in this room will go ahead and make a difference, make a change, make an impact in any sphere that you operate within. But the one question I leave you with is, if not you, when? If not you, who, sorry? And if not now, when? Thank you. <laughs>